Hi. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, it is our pleasure to introduce the linguist, prolific researcher, textbook editor, translator, author, and professor of English, uh, teaching at Kanto Gakuin University, Dr. Momoko Nakamura. Her research interests include the linguistic construction of gendered, sexualized identity, and her research methods demonstrate how important it is to examine historical discourse in order to understand how speech styles develop. Speech styles develop. In 2007, Dr. Nakamura published the book Ona Kotoba wa Skurareru, which won the Yamakawa Kiyoe Award. In 2014, a book written in English was published, Gender, Language and Ideology, a genealogy of Japanese women's language. This book denaturalizes the assumed common sense relationship between language and gender. By taking a historical approach, she explains the role taken by educators, the media and government in forming the Japanese women's language and the gendered norms of today. She's also translated into Japanese two volumes by the eminent feminist scholar, Deborah Cameron, further, further contributing to the resources of Japanese linguistics and gender studies. She is described by Professor Okamoto of the University of California as a preeminent scholar of Japanese language and gender. And on a personal note, I'd like to say that I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Nakamura speak at the Well Retreat held in Saitama in 2013. And she spoke about the uh, gendered quality of subtitles um, particularly related to uh, Western female characters in films, and um, it made a huge impression on me, and I'm personally just really, really excited to have her here with us today. Um, today, Dr. Nakamura will explain the gendered language used in translation of non-Japanese speech, and we would like you all to join us in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Nakamura. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction, Joanna and Queen B. Uh, hi, hello, everyone. I'm Momoko Nakamura, and it's my pleasure and honor to be able to share my interest with you, with you today. And I would like to thank and show my gratitude to JALP members uh, uh, for having me at this uh, wonderful, uh, friendly conference. Today, um, I'm going to talk about some of the topics I covered in my recent book, Honyaku ga tsukuru Nihongo, Translation Constructing Japanese Language. In this book, I argue that the translated speech of non-Japanese people plays an important role in constructing Japanese language. But uh, because of the time limit, I cannot talk about everything I wrote in the whole book. So today, I would like to focus on just two findings. One is that the speech of non-Japanese women has been predominantly translated into stereotypical women's language. And the second point is that the casual speech of non-Japanese men has been translated into a peculiar speech used only by non-Japanese men. And those are the actually uh, two conclusions my, of my today's talk. So I told you all of my conclusions already. <laughs> uh, the first, uh, I would like to start my talk uh, uh, about, uh, talking about the translated speech of non-Japanese women has been predominantly translated into stereotypical women's language. And what I mean by stereotypical women's language is that it is not the way of speaking Japanese women actually use. Rather, it is an ideological construct historically uh, formed by the discourses and if you are interested in 
uh, learning the why and how this notion of women's language has been formed in Japanese society, please uh, refer to my another book uh, they, they kindly introduced, uh, Gender, Language, and Ideology. And I will show the references at the end of my talk, too. So uh, this stereotypical women's language uh, ha uh, is the ideological construct many Japanese speakers uh, believe that there is, like the, the, the many Japanese speakers share that there is this uh, kind of way of speaking uh, uh, by speaking. And uh, it is considered to be characterized by the interjections, ara, ma, and the use of first person pronoun, atashi. Uh, for those who do not know Japanese, there are many different first person and second person pronouns in, Japan, in Japanese. And this particular pronoun, first person pronoun, is considered to be a strongly feminine feature that consists of women's language, and also uh, characterized by sentence final forms, kashira, dawa, wane, no yo, yone. And, and those, uh, in Japanese language, uh, speakers use uh, sentence final forms uh, not to change the, the, the the logical meaning of the utterance, but rather to add, um, you know, epistemic and uh, relational meaning, social meanings to to their utterances. So the st stereotypical example of women's language should be something like, "Ara, atashi henna no kashira," or oh, "Am I weird?" Yeah. And also, it is important that this ideology of Japanese women's language is associated with polite, indirect, and soft femininity. So it's also characterized by the use of some of the specific features, but as an ideology, it is related and associated with this polite, indirect, and soft femininity. Uh, then, before I get into the translation, I would like to uh, mention briefly about actual Japanese women's use of language. And uh, many studies have demonstrated that actual Japanese women hardly use the stereotypical women's language. Because, number one, women's language is a standard style. And most Japanese women are speakers of regional dialects, so they do not use it in everyday basis. And also, even in the standard speech areas, some studies have shown that the sentence final forms, kashira and dawa, are dead language. What they mean by dead language that hardly, not, you know, not many Japanese women talk with kashira and dawa. There are some women who talk with kashira and dawa, but not many. And also, interestingly, they found that the younger women are, the less they speak women's language. So uh, it deeper, the use of the women's language is different according to the generation. But the third finding indicates that the Japanese girls hardly use women's language. So my first example is Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. And this story was published in 1936 and translated into Japanese in 1957. Wow, even before I was born, no, oh, oh, that's not true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and you may think that this is an old story, but Japanese people really like this story. And just in 2011, it was played in the Imperial Theater as its 100 years anniversary. And so I, 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 I'm sure that many of you noticed these actors, actress and actors. And uh, the, the script used in this performance was written by Kikuta Kazuo. And Kikuta, the, the script by Kikuta Kazuo is based on the, on the 1957 translation. I checked uh, Kikuta Kazuo's script and found that there are not that many differences. 
So let's look at how Scarlett is speaking in the translation. She says, "Ya da wa o tou san. Atashi suere mitai ni oshabiri dewa nai koto yo. No dad, da wa. I atashi. I'm not talk talkative like swelling. So here you notice that she's speaking with da wa, dead language, <laughs> and atashi, I, the uh, you know, stereotypical feminine first person pronoun. And she also says, Ma sugoi, thousand dollars? Oh, great, three thousand dollars. So she's again using the stereotypical interjection, feminine interjection. And she says, Oka san ga o tou san to kekkon nasta no wa jugo no toki yo. Atashi wa mo juroku da wa. So here again, mother got married to father when she was 15. Yo, I, Atashi, am already 16, Dawa. So here again, she's speaking with, you know, Dawa, uh, the, one of the sentence final dead language. So we can conclude that uh, Scarlett O'Hara is speaking in stereotypical women's language. But you may think that, oh, Gone with the Wind is an old story and it's, it's about past. So let's look at more recent example. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And oh, how amazing uh, they have grown up. They look very different <laughs> and cute. But there's one girl, Hermione Granger, and, and this is how she speaks in Japanese translation. This is from the scene, Hermione appears for the first time in the story, in the train. She says, well, it's not very good, is it? So she's speaking with ma, stereotypical interjection. It's all worked for me, wa? Minna umaku itta wa? Nobody in my family is magic at all, no? It was ever such a surprise when I got my letter. And at this time, Hermione is 11 years old. And I don't know any 11 year old Japanese girl who speaks like this. So, uh, yeah, really. <laughs> so, uh, so, and, and as I pointed out before that in actual Japanese women you know, do not speak women's language very often, and, and especially young girls hardly use it, I said. So, but Hermione is speaking with stereotypical women's language here. What about the novel in, written in other languages? Uh, this is an example, Russian novel, The Brothers Karamazov. And there is one girl, Leeds, and she's 14 years old. And my example is from 2006 translation by Kameyama Ikuo. I like this story very, very much. Uh, and, uh, this is how Leeds is speaking. Why does, this is an English translation. Uh, uh, why doesn't he want to come and see Kashira? Doshite uchi ni kitagara nai no Kashira? Remember, Kashira was one of the two dead languages, uh, uh, you know, uh, considering the, the usage of the Japanese women. Uh, don't you let him know? Anata ga watashi no koto wo hanasanai no? You see, we, atashi tachi, know that he goes everywhere no yo? Atashi tachi chanto shitteru no yo? Why have you put that long cassock on him, Kashira? Again, Kashira. So in 2006 translation, Liz is speaking a lot of feminine fe features, in including kashira, atashi. Because of this strong tendency to translate the speech of non-Japanese women into stereotypical women's language, some translators apply women's language to the speech of a heroine whose characteristics uh, are opposite to the polite, indirect femininity associated with women's language. Oh, some of you already read the, the example. And this is an example from Alien. Uh, it's, Alien is a horror movie, very scary. Have you seen it? 
I hate horror movie, so it took me three days to watch it. I have to watch it in order to write the book. It was scary. And this is Ripley. It's a very scary story, a story about the spaceship. Uh, Arian is somehow born in a spaceship, and Arian kills the crew me member one by one. And after all the other crew members got killed, Ripley fights till the end. So she's a very strong, both mentally and physically strong woman, and she has, you know, she's determined to fight until the end. She is said to have established the icon of a fighting heroine in Hollywood. However, all through the film, in Japanese subtitles, she's speaking women's language. And, and this particular example is from the very last scene uh, after uh, Ripley narrowly escaped into an uh, escaping boat. And she says, I got you, you son of the bitch. <laughs> I don't know how bad this language is because I'm not a native speaker of English. But you know, you know, this is a very bad language, right? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm not supposed to say this, even in the conference? Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> no, no. And this line is translated as, Yatsuketa wa bakemono, taskatta no yo. Pretty nice feminine line, really. So, conclusion about uh, non-Japanese women's speech. Uh, there is a strong tendency to translate non-Japanese women's speech into women's language, at least since the 1950s, before I was born, <laughs> an implication about gender by using the stereotypical Japanese women's language to the speech of non-Japanese women beyond ethnic national boundaries that translators construct the polite, indirect, and soft femininity associated with Japanese women's language as if it is the natural attribute shared by women all over the world. We all know that gender is a social construct. We all know that feminine gender is a social construct which differs depending on the region and the culture but the kind of femininity shared by all women should be women's nature. So these translations work to naturalize this particular Japanese femininity. The polite, indirect, and soft femininity associated with Japanese women's language. Uh, and then I would like to go on to uh, the, the, the second uh, point, that the casual speech of non-Japanese men has been translated into a peculiar speech used only by non-Japanese men. So this is not used, spoken by Japanese, but this is a Japanese. Uh, the speech of non-Japanese men is translated in, in many styles, and it's translated into stereotypical men's language too. For example, ore wa ikuze, ore and ikuze. Ore is a typical masculine first-person pronoun, and ze is it also stereotypical sentence final, final forms. Or sometimes the speech of non-Japanese men is translated into incorrect Japanese. <laughs> which is characterized by strange intonation and then elonging of the vowel. This is sometimes kata called kota katakana nihongo. But I would like to focus on the third type of the, the translation used for the speech of non-Japanese men today. That is the speech style of cool, laid-back men. And this speech style is uh, characterized by the use of greeting, ya, yeah, and the, per the personal pronouns, boku, kimi, ore. 
These are the t stereotypical masculine first person pronouns too. And also sentence final forms, sa, kai, and dai. So the stereotypical example should be, yeah, boku wa John sa, genki kai? <laughs> Hi, I'm John, how are you? Yeah, boku wa John sa, genki kai? If the Japanese speaker hear this, and they will immediately know that the, 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 you know, the speaker of this utterance is a non-Japanese. Okay. <laughs> my first example is Bivari Hills 90210. And this TV drama is very popular in Japan, and it's aired from 1992 to 2013, more than two decades. The story starts when the twin sister and brother, Brenda and Brandon, moved to Bivari Hills. And, and that's Brenda. Uh, they don't look like high school students to me at all. Too mature. <laughs> too, <laughs> to me, too mature. But uh, Brenda, she's Brenda, and that's uh, Brandon. They're twin sister and brother. And I would like to focus on that conversation between Brandon and Dylan. Uh, Brandon is one of the you know, protagonist uh, twin brother, and Dylan is like kind of a long wolf type of two party student. And then Brandon got interested in Dylan, and Brandon went to talk to Dylan. And let's look at how they, they meet each other. Brandon says, yeah, boku wa Brandon Walsh da. Hi, my name is Brandon Walsh. So here, Brandon greets to uh, you know Dylan, saying "Yeah," and he calls himself Boku. And Brandon also says, "By way of Minnesota, sa Minnesota keyo sa." So here, he's speaking with the sentence final form "sa." And Brandon also says, "Are you hungry, Kai? Harahete nai Kai?" So and Dylan answers, "Feed the trip, sa." So both Brandon and Dylan are speaking with the sentence final form, sa. What about uh, other stories uh, written in other languages? Uh, in the Brothers Karamazov, there is a scene in which Alyosha and Lakichin are talking to each other. Alyosha is the youngest of the brothers Karamazov. He's about 20 years old at that time. And Lakichin, in the case you don't remember, Lakichin is a, also a young theology student studying with uh, Alyosha, the, uh, you know, at the Father Zoshima's uh, theology school. And again, this translation from 2006, translation by Kameyama. Uh, Lakichin is saying, Yes, uh, tell me one thing, Alyosha. What does that video mean, Dai? Masani kimisa, arete itai, nan no otsuge dai? So Rakichin is speaking with sa and dai here. And there are many other you know, features of this style there's, they're using too. And Alyosha also said, what video, sa, arete nani sa? So, uh, you know, they are both uh, communicating with, uh, in, within this style. And this is the thing, uh, the, this style is most, uh, most clearly used in the whole story. This is the casual conversation between young men. And interestingly, uh, the Brothers Kalamazov was first translated into Japanese in 1917 during the Taisho period. And I checked by, by Yonekawa Masao, and I checked Yone, how Yonekawa translated this thing. And surprise, to my surprise, Yonekawa used sa and dai already in, in Taisho period. So the speech, this speech style has been used since the Taisho period in 1917. Uh, tr Japanese trans translators have been using this style for a long time. And also this style is often applied to the speech of men engaged in specific occupations. The first example is Johnny Depp. He's an actor. 
Uh, and this is uh, from the adab Japanese advertisement of his film, The Libertine. Ato ni mo saki ni mo shougai de ichido shika meguri awanai sakuhin sa. This is the sort of work you can come, acro come across only once in a lifetime sa. And this is not what uh, Johnny Depp actually said. This is the this is the the, the caption of, of the copywriter made up for Johnny Depp, and the copywriter chose "sa" for what you know for his utterance. The second example is an athlete, Ronaldinho, uh, and, and at the, the as the headline of the interview to Ronaldinho, uh, it says Barcelona no kankyo saiko sa. The environment in Barcelona is the best, sa? And this is the headline of the newspaper article. And it, when I read the whole article, but Ronaldinho's utterance is translated as Barcelona no kikou mo seikatsu mo subete no men de saikou no kankyou ni aru. So in the main body of the article, Ronaldinho is not speaking with sa, even in Japanese. But the news writer chose sa for the headline. And the third example is musician, Sergio Mendes, the 65-year-old Brazilian musician. Do you know him? Yeah, he's well known as a girl from Ipanema. Okay, <laughs> but he, I chose him because he's not young. So uh, even though he's not young, because he's a musician, his you know speech is translated with "bossa nova wa enka music sa." Bossa nova is like Japanese popular ballad sa. This is a direct quotation of uh, his interview. So what is this sa? Nagasaki 1998 says, generally in the present usage, sa is understood. Well, I have to, uh, I have to uh, look at my, the computer from the distance because uh, my eyes are getting uh, old, you know, like, and organs. Generally in the present usage, sa is understood as an affective particle representing the image of detachment in casual conversation. So we can say that one of the function of the sentence final sa is to index the cool detachment and casual, cool and casual stances. But other studies found that Japanese men do not use sa. Reynolds 2001 found no instance of sa in the sentence final positions in 4,000 289 utterances of Japanese college students, casual conversation between young men. Or Yamanishi 2003 found the, the utterances of non-Japanese male athletes translated with sa, but Japanese athletes do not speak with sir, even in the same situations of being interviewed by a newspaper. Yamanishi analyzed the, the, the news, uh, news uh, articles about Olympic games. And after, uh, no, after uh, they finished the each game, uh, the news reporters went to interview the, 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 the you know, athletes. And when the athlete answers in Japanese, they, they cannot change the way they speak, right? But when the athletes are from outside Japan, and the news reporters translate their, their comments into Japanese. And, and that's why there is such differences in the way uh, of the comments and uh, of the Japanese athletes and non-Japanese athletes. Why do Japanese men avoid using sa? We may be able to find the answer in the Japanese parody of Bibari here's nine or two one oh. And the title is Dylan and Catherine Bibari Hills Fine Weather Report. And the person standing in the in the no in the shirt, red and uh, red and white shirt, he is a Japanese Dylan and the Catherine is the girl uh, you know standing in front of him in the pink sweater. 
Well, Catherine actually does not appear in the original TV drama. So this is uh, you know, like a Japanese uh, parody. And uh, Japanese, in this parody, Japanese comedians pretend to be California high school students. And it's very interesting. Their attires, all of them, as you notice, wear brown or uh, blonde wigs, and sometimes they wear plastic high noses, and also gesture. They keep shrugging. Because shrugging is not included as in a Japanese body movement, uh, every time a Japanese comedian pretends to be a Westerner, probably the first thing he or she does is to shrug. Okay, so, and so in addition, then speech, the use of sa and the greeting ya. Yeah. And Coupland 2007 says, style is a multimodal, multidimensional clusters of linguistic and other semiotic practices. So all these attires and shrug gestures, including shrugging, and the kind of speech using sa and the greeting ya, yeah, we can say constitutes the kind of style we can call the cool, laid-back style associate, associated with specific non-Japanese masculinity. So at the beginning of the parody, Dylan introduces himself. My name is Dylan yeah, this is Japanese Dylan. Japanese Dylan introduces himself. My name is Dylan Make. I'm an average teenager, crazy about love, dance, and rock. So, ore no namae wa Dylan Make. Koi to dance to rock ni mujuna, goku heikin teki na teenager. So, here. Can you read that his introduction itself reveals the Japanese stereotype of young American men? They are only interested in love, dancing, rock. And he also uh, introduces himself with Sa. Oh, okay. He also introduces himself with Sa. Then Dylan goes on to introduce his friend Kevin. So then they greet each other. Dylan says, yeah, Kevin, hi, Kevin. And Kevin says, yeah, Dylan, hi, Dylan and they keep shrugging, so please pay. <laughs> and sometimes, instead of shrugging their shoulders, they go like this. <laughs> so, so this is it's supposed to be shrugging. Hi, right, Kevin. いや、ディナ。ああ、どうだ、調子は。今日もいい天気だし、最高の気温さ。絶好の予習不修日和になったよ。なるほど。ま、先生頑張りたまえな。Thank you. Oh, you can see that Kevin is wearing a plastic high nose here, too. <laughs> so he's a nice guy who has an incredible dream to get the job at NASA and launch a shuttle in the future. So, shoulai wa NASA ni shushoku shite shuttle wo uchiage tai nante tondemunai ime homotta nice guy, sa. Let's watch again. I love it. <laughs> Hi, 
成績は常に学年トップの生徒会長だルールを重んじる堅物だが俺とは妙に気が合う将来は NASA に就職してシャトルを打ち上げたいなんてとんでもない夢を持ったナイスガイさん So their speech and gesture induce laughter from Japanese audience as well as、uh, non Japanese audience because it shows how awkward the Japanese can be when, try, they, when they try to look, move, and speak just like they are stereotypes of non Japanese. So, one of the reasons Japanese men avoid using the style is that because the style is associated. With a Japanese stereotype of non Japanese men. So they are cool and laid back, but not serious and polite enough to be ideal Japanese masculinities. The conclusion so, Japanese translation practices have invented a specific speech style of non Japanese men, an implication about gender. By using the style, the translators distinguish non Japanese casual, cool casual masculinity from Japanese masculinities. The distinction works to legitimate hegemonic Japanese masculinity, masculinities such as polite formal masculinity of salary men. So, the conclusions for my talk today are the speech of non Japanese women. Such translations serve to naturalize the femininity associated with Japanese women's language. And the second conclusion about the casual speech of non Japanese men such translations serve to distinguish non Japanese casual masculinity from Potentially、uh, acceptable Japanese masculinities, legitimating an ideal status of polite, formal Japanese masculinity. And these are the references. And, and the, the, this Momoko Nakamura 2041 is the one I was talking about gender, language, and ideology, published by John Benjamins. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to leave、uh, plenty of time for questions and comments, please.、Well, yes. Do you need a microphone? You'll need one to answer. You had a question. I'm curious about、um, so you talked about translations of books and subtitles. Although you talked about a play as well, but I'm wondering about、uh, voiceover, especially children's animated movies.、Uh, what, what happens in those cases?、Uh, uh, movies for children. Yes,、yeah, so、like Disney movies.、Uh -huh. you know, Frozen. Good question. Thank you very much for an interesting question. I, I wanted to talk about it, but I didn't have time.、Uh, I, you, actually, I do. I'm glad. Thank you very much for a good question. <laughs> Uh, have you heard of the notion of role language,、uh, role, uh, role languages proposed by Kinsley, Satoshi Kinsley?、Uh, he talks about、uh, the, the set of speech styles used only in fiction and call it role languages. Because,、uh, for example,、uh, I'll give you an example first.、Uh, there's Hakase Go,、uh, the, the speech style of, of Hakase. And it's used by, for example, Professor Dumbledore or、uh, Ochanobi Hakase, the old man with wisdom and who、uh, helps the protagonist. And there's a special、uh, speech style, and they, those Hakase, Hakase, the a n t i n o o n a wise man, old, wise old man, usually a、yeah, scholar c a l l them Washi, Washi wa Nantoka, Ja. Yeah,、uh, and th 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 this, this is a typical example of role language. And, and uh, uh, he says that 
Japanese people uh, have uh, created all those raw languages in order to, for the economy of description. What he means by economy of description is like, you can spend a lot of words to describe the protagonist, but when you describe the side characters, you want to uh, describe the side characters clearly in, in a short term. So if, uh, if you, uh, the writer used hakasego, to, uh, for the uh, let the let the old wise man to use the hakase, the readers immediately know that the hakase uh, is an old wise man. That pr the character is an old wise man who is expected to help the protagonist, and and he also said that the use of these role languages are. Uh, uh, observed more clearly in children's book books or, or works uh, written and made for children. Uh, yes, th so that's a good question. And so Japanese women's language, uh, in a sense, is a role language too. And this, uh, the style of cool laid back man is a role language too, in a sense, because it's made for fiction. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, do you have any other question? Well, where did you do, what did you do with your microphone? Uh, uh, I have no, it, I have no, it now. No worry, there are two more microphones here. <laughs> Me, her? Uh, in, in, in children's uh, animation like manga, cartoons. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. hey. Yes, uh, good question th too. Thank you very much. Used to be uh, used by, uh, by uh, a female protagonist too, but gradually uh, uh, evil Villanian female characters study speaking women's language. So there's a difference, uh, uh, you know, depending on the, on the time the cartoon and manga was created. Used to be uh, uh, female protagonists spoke women's language. But nowadays, if you watch the uh, uh, cartoons for children, most of the time the evil uh, female characters tend to use women's language. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah. But there's a, uh, also uh, always exceptions too. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks for the... We need somebody who... Did. Okay. Okay. Come back. Oh, <laughs> Don't leave yet. <laughs> Hi. Um, this is, it just seems like a weird kind of othering to me. Uh, why? Why is this done? Why are they doing that to which, us? Which one? Both. Uh, both. Like, wh yeah. why would they give a strong female character? Is it too scary? Is she too scary? So she has to be feminized? Uh, mm, uh, there's also an interesting study uh, that shows that uh, in the fiction, uh, when the female characters say something very, something like, say something directly or give orders, then those female characters tend to use women's language. So the, the function and meaning of, of women's language is changing too. Good question, yes, thank you. Uh, there are interesting studies by Mizumoto Sensei, very interesting study. And thank you very much for all the comments and responses. I'm very glad. Yeah. But I need somebody who carries the microphone to the questioners. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. It was so interesting. Thank and you. <laughs> something has been driving me crazy for years. Um, on the news, when they uh, voice over, say, um, an Italian woman or a French woman, uh, if of a certain age, like maybe over middle age, they go, so the, you know, the voice is like very, not to, but, but the original language doesn't have that feeling at all. Why? I'm curious about how you feel about that. That's, a, that's a, like a part of the stereotypes of, 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 of uh, translators too. And also there is the mood in Japanese society to uh, want to have somebody who still speak 
women's language uh, at the time when no Japanese women, you know, speak speak it. So it's very interesting. Women's language is said to be one of the traditional characteristic of Japanese language. Many Japanese linguists, you know, say declare that we have women's language. It's very peculiar and characterized Japanese language, but. It is the speech of non-Japanese women who maintain this tradition of Japanese language. What a contradiction and interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, we will get into the issue of language ideologies. Thank you very much for pointing out the interesting. I'd like to pick up Oh, on you already have a microphone. Yeah. Good. To pick up Thank on the you. comments before. Question about, again, the why, looking at ideology, economics, expectations, uh, and ownership. So when you have a strong character like Ripley and Aliens or Wonder Woman, these strong women characters from Hollywood movies and so on, the directors and producers have this, you know, the woman they've created that character and a sense of ownership and they have the rights, that's their movie basically. When it's sold to Mexico and Japan and Korea and around the world, do they not have some say in saying, when this is translated into Japanese, we want to keep the strong woman character, this dynamic person, which is the key heroine in our movie, or do they say, do what you want, we sold the rights, do, you know, change the character as you like. So I'm curious about the ownership of the producers and directors and if they just give that away or don't care. On the Japanese side, I'm thinking the why, 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 the same question. One might be, you know, unconscious or conscious, old patriarchal values, you know, we have to keep going with the Japanese sex roles and have it in the movies in a sort of a ideological style. Or economics, wow, Japanese audiences, if we don't translate into Japanese women's language, they won't come and see our movies. That's an economic decision. What are your thoughts about ownership yeah, on ownership. the side of the directors yeah, good and point. the expectations, the economics uh -huh. of the... About the ownership, um, I uh, distributed a questionnaires to uh, trans Japanese translators who have been working on the translation of the, of the films and TV dramas. And what, they, uh, what I learned was that most of the time they are working in a team nowadays. So, uh, and then th uh, there, there is a strong rule uh, they share in, 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 in the way that th they translate the, the each line and then uh, the, 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 dis the film distrib distributor, film and drama distributor is their clients. So uh, there is that, like many of them said that we have the rule how to translate this into this. And I don't know about whether the Hollywood, like in the case of the alien Hollywood producers say, I know, don't translate Ripley's line like this, but Hollywood produ producers doesn't know Japanese. So they may, they may, they may, they sh may I don't know, it's necess necessary for them to hire somebody to check that, but, uh, but I don't know what they are doing. But the second point uh, uh, is that the, the Alien is the film made in 1970s, and, and gradually there is the, you know, differences. I was very surprised to see those the lines of the Ripley in the subtitles all all translated with women's language because in reading subtitles there's a number of words you can put on the screen and there's limitations about the number of words but still the translator wanted to put those feminist endings that's like each it, it demonstrate how strong it is that they want to put those feminine endings, but it's long time ago, like, you know, more than uh, 30 years ago, and nowadays, less and less translated, and so there is a movement not to use those well, women's language to the strong women, because uh, strong women motivated by feminist, you know, feminist uh, uh, intentions are not supposed to... <laughs> to speak in a style which is related to traditional femininity. Thank you very much for very important two points. Uh, thank you. And then uh, I think I have time for one more question. Oh, thank you. Sorry uh, for this amount. Of, uh, they, Sorry, she already a has a microphone. You have to grab the microphone I apologize. first. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, as a non-Japanese speaker, um, I, I was wondering about Japanese, character, uh, Japanese female characters in Japanese movies and TV shows, the kind of language that they speak. What kind of language do Japanese women characters speak? 
are they given scripts where they're speaking this women's language or are they given scripts that, uh, that show something different, that reflects more naturally what Japanese women actually say? Oh, it depends on the characters and the, and the journey of the, of the work. Oh. But I'm not saying that uh, Japanese women uh, in, in, fiction, in fictions always... Uh, I'm not saying that Japanese women in fiction always uh, speak women's language. But uh, it's women's language, it's true that women's language and men's language and then and then this cool backside are one of the linguistic resources those uh, media producers can use to construct their characters. So it depends on the situation and it depends on the genre. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, well, I think I, I have time for one more question for that gentleman over there. Uh, you keep, uh, thank you. Um, I was just curious about like if Asian Americans and other Americans are translated in this way, because there may be a situation where the character still looks like the person that they're trying to, the person that for the country that they're originally from, or may even be a Japanese person living in America. Are they still translated with this style? Thank you very much. That's, uh, uh, thank you for bringing up an interesting point. That's another thing I wanted to tell you. Uh, before, before the women's, lang women's language was uh, applied only to the speech of white women, white women. And for uh, usually, the, the, for example, like uh, black slaves in their works like uh, uh, Gone with the Wind, Huckleberry Finn, and then Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, their speech was translated into Tohoku dialect. Nantoka de gozaimasu. And there is no gender differences. And, may, and people hated it. My, one of my friends is from Tohoku. She hates that. And so nowadays, no translator uses Tohoku dialects in translating the speech of those black slaves. And then when they stopped using Tohoku dialect, they started using women's language to black women as well. Uh -huh. And the same thing can be applied to Asian Americans and everything. Thank you very much, I'm afraid, yeah. Thank you. We want to give our thank you to you. It was our great honor to have this wonderful presentation today. We hope that you all enjoyed it. It seemed that there was a lot of discussion sparked at the end. We hope you've taken something very interesting home. I personally enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much.